In the last video, you saw the basic beam surge algorithm. In this video, you learn some little changes that make it work even better. Length normalization is a small change to the beam surge algorithm that can help you get much better results. Here's what it is. We talked about beam surge as maximizing this probability. And this product here is just expressing the observation that p of y1 up to yty given x uh, can be expressed as p of y1 given x times p of y2 given x and y1 times dot 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 uh, up to, I guess, p of y ty given x and uh, y1 up to y ty minus 1. Okay, but then maybe this notation is a bit more scary and more intimidating than it needs to be, but this is that uh, probability, product of probabilities that you've seen previously. Now, if you're implementing these, these probabilities are all numbers less than 1. In fact, often they're much less than 1. And multiplying a lot of numbers less than 1 will result in a tiny, tiny, tiny number, which can result in numerical underflow, meaning that it's too small for the floating point representation in your computer to uh, store accurately. So in practice, instead of maximizing this product, we will um, take logs. And if you insert a log there, then the log of a product becomes a sum of a log. And maximizing this sum of log probabilities should give you the same result in terms of uh, selecting the most likely sentence y. So by taking logs, you end up with a more numerically stable algorithm that is less prone to um, rounding errors, numerical rounding errors, or to really numerical underflow. And because the log function, that's the log grouping function, this is a strictly monotonically increasing function, maximizing p of y. And because the logarithmic function, here's the log function, is a strictly monotonically increasing function, we know that maximizing log p of y given x should give you the same result as maximizing p of y given x. Um, as in the same value of y that maximizes this should also maximize that. So in most implementations, you keep track of the sum of logs of the probabilities rather than the product of the probabilities. Now, there's one other change to this objective function that makes the uh, machine translation algorithm work even better, which is that um, if you refer to this original objective up here, if you have a very long sentence, the probability of that sentence is going to be low because you're multiplying as many terms here, lots of numbers are less than one, to estimate the probability of that sentence. And so if you multiply a lot of numbers that are less than one together, you just tend to end up with a smaller probability. And so this objective function has an undesirable effect that it maybe unnaturally tends to prefer very short translations, tends to prefer very short outputs. Because the probability of a short sentence is determined just by multiplying fewer of these numbers are less than 1. And so the product will just be not quite as small. And by the way, the same thing is true for this. The log of a probability is always um, less than or equal to 1. You're actually in this range of a log. So the more terms you add together, the more negative this thing becomes. So there's one other change to the algorithm that makes it work better, which is instead of using this as the objective you're trying to maximize, one thing you could do is normalize this by the number of words in your translation. And so this uh, takes the average of the log of the probability of each word. Now, and this, and, and this significantly reduces the penalty for outputting longer translations. And in practice, um, as a heuristic, instead of dividing by ty, by the number of words in the output sentence, sometimes you use a softer approach where you have ty to the power of alpha, where maybe alpha is equal to 
0 0.7. Um, so if alpha was equal to 1, then you are completely normalizing by length. If alpha was equal to 0, then, well, ty to the 0 would be 1. Then you're just not normalizing at all. And this is somewhere in between full normalization and no normalization. And um, alpha is another parameter or hyperparameter of the algorithm that you can tune to try to get the best results. And um, have to admit, using alpha this way, this is a heuristic or this is a hack. There isn't a great theoretical justification for it, but people have found that this works uh, well. Uh, people have found that it works well in practice, so many groups will do this. And you can try out different values of alpha um, until and, and see which one gives you the best result. So just to wrap up how you run beam search, as you run beam search, you see a lot of sentences with length equal one, um, law sentences with length equal two, law sentences with length equals three, and so on. And maybe you run beam search for 30 steps. You consider output sentences up to length 30, let's say. And so with uh, beam width of three, you would, keeping, you would be keeping track of the top three possibilities for each of these possible sentence lengths, one, two, three, four, and so on, up to 30. Then you would look at all the um, output sentences and score them against this score. And so you can take your top sentences and just compute this objective function on the sentences that you have seen through the beam search process. And then finally, of all these sentences that you evaluate this way, you would pick the one that achieves the highest value on this um, normalized log probability objective. Sometimes it's called a normalized log likelihood objective. And then that would be the final translation you output. So that's how you implement beam search. And you get to play this yourself in this week's programming exercise. Finally, a few implementational details. How do you choose the beam with B? The larger B is, the more possibilities you're considering and thus the better the sentence you probably find. But the larger B is, the more computationally expensive your algorithm is because you're also keeping a lot more possibilities around. Right. So finally, let's just wrap up with um, some thoughts on how to choose the beam with B. So here are the pros and cons of setting B to be very large versus very small. If the beam width is very large, then you consider a lot of possibilities. And so you tend to get a better result because you're considering a lot of different options, but it will be slower. And the memory requirements will also grow. It will also be computationally slower. Um, whereas if you use a very small beam width, then you get a worse result because you're just keeping less possibilities in mind as the algorithm is running. Um, but you get a result faster, and the memory requirements will also be lower. So in the previous video, we used in our running example a beam width of three, so we're keeping three possibilities in mind. In practice, that is on the small side. In production systems, it's not uncommon to see a beam width maybe around 10, um, and I think a beam width of 100 would be considered very large for a production system, depending on the application. Um, but for research systems where people want to squeeze out you know, every last drop of performance in order to publish a paper with the best possible result, it's not uncommon to see people use beam waves of 1,000 or 3,000. But this is um, very application as well as uh, domain dependent. So I would say try out a variety of values of B um, and see what works for your application. But when B gets very large, there is often diminishing returns. So for many applications, I would expect to see a huge gain as you go from a beam width of 1, which is basically greedy search, to 3, to maybe 10. But the gains as you go from 1,000 to 3,000 in beam width uh, might not be as big. And for those of you that have taken um, maybe a lot of computer science courses before, uh, if you're familiar with computer science search algorithms like BFS breadth search or DFS depth search, the way to think about beam search is that 
Unlike those other algorithms which you might have learned about in a computer science algorithms course, and don't worry about it if you've not heard of these algorithms, but if you've heard of breadth of search or depth of search, then um, unlike those algorithms, which are exact search algorithms, beam search runs much faster, but does not guarantee to find the exact maximum for this argmax that you like to find. Uh, if you haven't heard of breadth of search or depth of search, don't worry about it. It's not important for our purposes. But uh, if you have, this is how beam search relates to those algorithms. So that's it for beam search, which is a widely used algorithm in many production systems or in many commercial systems. Now, in the third course in this sequence of courses on deep learning, we talk a lot about error analysis. It turns out one of the most useful tools I've found is to be able to do error analysis on beam search. So you sometimes wonder, should I increase my beam width? Is my beam width working well enough? And there's some simple things you can compute to give you guidance on whether you need to work on improving your search algorithm. Let's talk about that in the next video.